Welcome to the Project Here Speaker Series presentation featuring Professor Gary King. Uh, my name is Matt Ingram, Associate Professor at the University at Albany, SUNY, and a former fellow and current member of the Executive Committee of Project Here. On behalf of the co-directors of Project Here, Richard Ball and Norm Medeiros, as well as the other members of Project Here's Executive Committee, I'd like to welcome you to today's session. Today's presentation is the second of nine weekly webcasts that will feature leaders in the transparency and uh, reproducibility movement. We are truly excited to offer this series and would like to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for their generous sponsorship and continued support of Project TIER. I'd also like to thank Alex Sabbath at Haverford College for coordinating the technical aspects of this series. In case you experience audio or video difficulties during the broadcast, please know that we will be recording today's session and posting it to the Project Tier website for later viewing. And now for the reason you're here. It's an honor to introduce today's speaker, Gary King. Gary is the Weatherhead University professor at Harvard University, one of 25 with Harvard's most distinguished faculty title. He also serves as director of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science. He and his research group develop and apply empirical methods in many areas of social science research, focusing on innovations that span the range from statistical theory to practical application. He is an elected fellow in eight honorary societies and has won more than 55 prizes and awards for his work. He was elected president of the Society for Political Methodology and vice president of the American Political Science Association. He has been a member of the senior editorial board at Science, visiting fellow at Oxford and senior science advisor to the World Health Organization. He has written more than 170 journal articles, 20 open source software packages and eight books. His presentation uh, entitled Statistically Valid Inferences from Privacy Protected Data, examines the problem that large amounts of useful data are generally inaccessible to researchers because these data are protected by privacy constraints. He presents a solution for data access and analysis that still protects the privacy of individuals included in these data collections while also protecting the statistical inferences of researchers. Gary will present for approximately 45 minutes, after which we'll have a few minutes available for questions. Throughout the presentation, please type your questions into the Q&A panel on Zoom towards the bottom of your window. I'll assemble the, I will assemble the questions and pose them to Gary as time permits at the end of his talk. So without further ado, I will now turn the broadcast over to Professor Gary King. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, you should all get out a piece of paper and write down, you have a piece of paper, write down, don't forget Valentine's Day present on the way home. All right, now that we got that settled, um, let me give you some slides here. All right, I hope you can see that. Uh, <clears throat> I will, um, so I'm going to talk. Um, I can't see anybody, but I know you're all you're all uh, waving. Um, in any event, um, uh, we, we'll have question and answer uh, today, but if you don't get to get your question answered or you have something else that occurs to you, please send me an email, um, king at harvard.edu. I'd be happy to answer it. Um, uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, Georgie Evans. Down at, I don't know, can you see, Matt, can they see my, uh, my yes. cursor going like that? Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. So this is uh, joint work with Georgie Evans, who's a, a graduate student at Harvard uh, and also a co-author of mine on a, another paper, also on differential privacy. Uh, uh, in addition to Georgie, there's Meg. Meg is also a graduate student at Harvard, also in the, in the Harvard government department. She's also actually Joe, Joe Biden's chief data scientist. Um, that's actually true. Um, at the same time while she's in graduate school. Um, and, and my last co-author is Ab Aberdeep, who is at UCSC and also this year at Google. Um, so our um, goal, our ultimate goal, is to figure out how to liberate lots of data from the commercial world and the government world and the nonprofit world and all the other organizations outside of academia and enable, it, enable them to share the data with us academics. Um, we have 
more data than ever before. And that has created spectacular progress in lots of different areas. Um, just, just over the last few decades, it has changed us from a discipline in which we study things to a discipline or a set, set of disciplines in which we actually solve problems. It's moved us from the humanities into the sciences. It really is something to write home about. It's very important. It's awesome to be part of. Um, however, even though we have more data than ever before, and we know what to do with it more than ever before, we have a smaller fraction of data in the world than ever before. Because most of the data now that exists in the world is actually tied up inside private companies and governments and, and elsewhere. So we want to figure out ways of liberating those data. So one generic way is, as it says here, solving political problems technologically. So that's, what, that's sort of the theme of, of today's talk. We're gonna to try to solve some political problems of data sharing via technological means. No matter what the facts say, of course, people can make political arguments and keep doing what they wanna do, but we wanna take away some of their arguments. And so the particular arguments we're going to take away today are, have to do with data sharing. So let me start by talking about convincing Facebook to make data available. If you saw the news yesterday, um, you will see that we actually, we actually succeeded in liberating a very large data set um, from, from Facebook. We worked very closely with, with Facebook for the last 20 months. Um, we intended to work very closely with Facebook for with, uh, for two months, but it took quite a lot longer than expected. Um, the data set itself has 10 trillion numbers in it. So it's, it, 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 it potentially could be incredibly informative about the effects of social media on elections and democracy. So let me just give you one page telling you where that came from, because it actually is an example of solving a political problem technologically, but in this case, it was by a constitutional design. So I'm out at Facebook trying to convince them to make data available. And I'd been out there lots, lots before and um, just trying to, trying to figure out how to, how to, how to convince them. Um, <clears throat> I'm in my hotel room packing to go home and I get an email from my Facebook friends and they say, hey, what do we do about this? And this was Cambridge Analytica, like the biggest scandal that hit a corporation in a long, long time. And it was about an academic that violated his personal responsibilities and gave the data to a company and that created Cambridge Analytica. It was an enormous, an enormous problem. So this was an enormous problem for me also because it was basically the worst timed lobby event in the history of the world. I mean, it was crazy, right? So fine, I went home, no big deal. You know, I had a nice trip out there. <clears throat> but fortunately, a few days later, they called me uh, and they said, hey, Gary, could you do a study of the 2016 election and tell everybody that we didn't change the outcome or maybe if we did something wrong, um, tell us what it is and we'll fix it right away. You know, losing $100 billion in market capitalization sort of tends to focus the mind, don't you think? Um, in any event, um, so they, they, they asked me to do this and I said, well, I would love to do this study. I would love to have um, all the access to be able to do this study, but I need two things and I think you're only going to give me one. So I'm, I'm literally talking to Mark Zuckerberg on the phone, and I said, I need two things. Here's the two things I need you to give me. First is, of course, I need complete access to the data and the people and the processes and the platforms and, and everything. You give employees access to all of that. That's the first thing I need. He said, fine. Second thing is, however, I need no pre-publication approval by the company. You never give employees that. But if you if you filter what I publish based upon whether it makes you look good, then nothing I actually do publish would be of any value whatsoever. So I need complete access, no pre-publication approval. And he said, oh, we're not going to give you both of those. And I said, okay, well, that's fine. I'm not going to do the study. He said, no, 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 I want you to do the study. I said, well, okay, give me both of those. He said, no, I, I don't want to give you both of those. I said, well, okay, you know, I mean, you can imagine, right? We went back and forth. And then eventually I said, well, wait a second instead of giving me both of those two things, how about we have a two-part solution? We create two groups and you give one of those things to, to one group and another to another group. And so here's the two groups. First are outside academics, outside academics who write proposals to analyze Facebook data. Um, um, if the proposals are approved by a particular process that I'm gonna describe, the company gets no veto. So there's no pre-publication approval for that group. 
<clears throat> However, they don't get to study anything they want. They propose studying specific things. Those specific things are evaluated by a trusted third party of distinguished senior academics at a um, nonprofit we set up called Social Science One. And um, this trusted third party would have access to all the information at Facebook, and they would also be trusted academics. So they'd be trusted by both sides. They'd sign NDAs. They would agree not to publish from the data at all. So they're sort of doing a public service. They would choose data sets, make final decisions. Um, and uh, if there was a proposal, that was totally meritorious, past peer review, would be a really great study, but it happened to touch on a subject that Facebook was being, it was involved in litigation about, then we wouldn't allow that study to go forward. We would reject the proposal, even though it was a great proposal, because it would get the academics into the middle of a lawsuit, which would mess, it, mess things up for the academics and mess things up for the company. That's an example of the kind of thing we would say no to. So that, so that way we would stand up for the academics and also stand up for the company. So that's, the, the, that's how the thing worked. And, and for that, Facebook agreed. <clears throat> um, so that was terrific. With this technological solution, problem was solved. There was no balancing of costs and benefits from each side. Um, or, um, we basically um, <clears throat> found a solution that was incentive compatible for all. There were agreements, um, lots of legal agreements. There was big announcements. When Mark Zuckerberg testified before Congress, he described this. There was funding from a whole set of foundations. Facebook assigned more than 30 people um, just on this project. There was, however, just one issue that popped up after all this and this um, self-congratulations. And that is that the uh, Facebook's plan to implement all this, well, it was illegal. So it was uh, violated uh, not only the law, but you know, privacy concerns and all kinds of things. And so that wasn't possible. So now all of a sudden we had another problem. So the next problem was how do you share data with academics without the data leaving Facebook, without making the academics move to Facebook. So how are we gonna do that? So now we have a new problem. And that's basically what this talks about. So the new problem is gonna be solved by something that is not only gonna be applied at Facebook, but I think pretty much, uh, maybe not everywhere, but in many, many areas. So, and basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna switch from a data sharing regime to a data access regime, which I'll describe. This is going to involve another political problem that we're going to solve technologically, but this time the technology is going to be computer science and statistics, social science. Um, the data sharing regime we're all completely familiar with, right? The idea is I give you data, maybe you sign a data use agreement, and that's it. That's the whole thing. Um, a data access regime is different. So let me just go back and tell you about the data sharing regime and, then, and what the problem is, and then we'll do the data access regime. The data access regime is venerable. When I was in graduate school, that's what we did. When, you know, decades before that, that's what we did. That's what they did. Um, but it is failing. It is not working. Well, why is that? Why is it failing? Well, there's more and more public concern with privacy. And scholars recently have discovered that de-identification doesn't actually protect people's identities. That's really a bummer. So, so de the idea of de-identification de is, Let's say you do a survey and you take off people's names and telephone numbers and addresses, and then you have the rest of the survey, right? Well, it turns out if you know just little bits of information about the row that is the person that you're trying to find out about, you can re-identify everybody else. And there've been intentional attacks by academics, not to hurt anybody, it, that show basically you can re-identify, you know, a vast array of, of quote, uh, supposedly de-identified data. Um, so the identification doesn't work, but it turns out aggregation to, to anonymize does not work. Query auditing, you can only ask certain questions, that doesn't work. Data clean rooms, that doesn't work. Legal agreements, that doesn't work. Restricted viewing, paired programmer models, none of these things worked. So that's, in, in fact, trusting researchers, like just get researchers that are trustworthy, and trust them, well, that fails spectacularly at times. That was the Cambridge Analytica example. Um, the, the guy that gave, all, gave uh, the data to a private company during Cambridge Analytica was an academic who was known very well to Facebook. He'd been to Facebook headquarters multiple times, and he just 
just violated his rules. In fact, just to make things even worse, there's even some articles that show that trusting a researcher who acts trustworthy can also fail and inadvertently um, uh, leak privacy information uh, in ways that it wasn't intended. So what the heck are we going to do about this, right? Because this is like the, the, the fundamental basis of the social sciences, right? We get data from people. Well, it turns out there's another way of going, going forward, and that's a data access regime. Here's the idea. We get a trusted server, a computer server, that holds the data. Um, researchers are treated not as trustworthy, but as adversaries, potentially trying to go and, and, uh, and break into a system and use it for, for, to learn about individuals or things like, things like that. If you say, well, academics would no, never do that, you say Cambridge Analytica. If you say, well, we would never do that, you know, okay, I, I get that. I do think academics should be trusted, but sometimes academics are in the situation of wanting to know personal information about, about others, you know, maybe a, a celebrity or their ex-spouse or, you know, you can imagine, right? Uh, um, their tenure committee. Um, anyway, maybe I should stop. I'm making uh, all of you uncomfortable, including myself. So let's just go on. <laughs> um, uh, so, the, so there's a trusted server, it has the data. Um, Researchers are outside, they can go to the server and pose a, pose a question, that is they can run a statistical method, any method, and they get back the answers to the, to the, to the query, you know, the, the statistical results, but they don't get that back the, the results they normally get. They get back a noisy answer with a very specific type of noise added to the data. Um, they can only run an al a specific analysis a, a limited number of times, so they can't average away the noise. Um, and it turns out that's protective. The goal is to make it mathematically impossible to violate individual privacy, but at the same time, possible to discover population level patterns. If you think about it, we're social scientists. We don't care about anybody. We only care about everybody in, in a sense, right? So if you add noise to a column in a spreadsheet, well, and you go back to one of the one of the rows, you might, you know, you wouldn't be able to identify who was who. But if you take the average of that column, the noise, if it had mean zero, would cancel each other out, and we still might be able to see the signal. So that's the idea here. That is known as differential privacy. I'll give you a more specific definition, but that's the basic idea. Um, the cool thing about it is it is a political, it is a technological solution to a political problem that seems to satisfy regulators. Um, because there's no way to violate individual privacy. So it, it, it seems like a way forward, a way for academics to have access to data to potentially create a lot of public good without the possibility of them violating privacy inadvertently or intentionally. There is, however, a new problem. So this is a second slide, second problem, right? So what's the new problem? Well, most differentially private algorithms which try to balance um, uh, privacy and, and, and leak out not enough privacy to violate anybody's, uh, to violate anybody's privacy um, and provide utility. Unfortunately, the computer scientists that set, the, set, this up, set these algorithms up, they're not statisticians, they're not social scientists. And if you analyze them from a statistical point of view, they're biased, inconsistent. They have all the bad statistical properties that we try to avoid in normal, normal data analysis. Um, so, so in particular, they have unknown statistical properties. And when, they, when you figure out what they are, they're usually biased. And they, have, they come with no uncertainty estimates. So we have to fix both of these problems. And that's, what I'm, that's what I'm going to do today. Or I'm going to give you an example of how to do that. So now I'm going to talk about differential privacy and inferential validity. Um, <clears throat> differential privacy is this field of computer science and inferential validity is what we're going to layer on top of it. We, of course, have been doing inferential validity it, throughout the history of the social sciences. So we want to add both. Let me explain to you the context here. So here's a um, column of, col uh, here's our population. Right? So suppose there's a population of people. I got, I got uh, hidden in there is, is Gary and Megan, Aberdeep and, you know, Georgie, et cetera, uh, and various others. Um, so imagine there's a whole population of people. Um, the mean income in the United States is about $48,000. That's what it, that's what is at the bottom. 
let's suppose that's our quantity of interest. That's the thing we care about. That's the thing we want to estimate, the $48,000. Okay, how do we normally do that? Normally, well, we don't go to everybody in the population. We take some kind of sample. So here's a sample. We only get the ones with the names, all of the millions of people above there we don't get. Um, so that's our, that's our data generating process, right? We, this, we see the population through this, through this limited means and we get, a, we get our sample. So here's an example of, a, of data we might, get, we might get where we don't get anybody in that first row which represents millions and millions of people. The result of the um, analysis of these data is the $108,000, right? Now, the interesting thing is when we take a survey and we, we analyze the results of the survey, we do not care about the results of the survey by themselves at all. They have no interest to us. If we wanna know who, who's gonna win the presidential election, it doesn't matter uh, what the results of the survey are by themselves. They're only relevant to the extent that you can use them to infer to the population of interest. So in this case, we want to use that third column to make an inference uh, about, the, about the first column. So that this is basically classic statistical inference where we use the, we use the third column here. Um, we pay attention to the data generation process, which is the second column, to try to figure out what's going on in the first, first column. Okay, so, but this, this 108 or, or this whole column is not of any direct interest. Just like a survey where 90% of the people won't answer a, a, a survey, they'll just hang up on you, right? So you have to correct for the data generation process. Anyway, we've all been doing that for a long time. Okay, now let's think about it from a computer science point of view. From the computer science point of view, they ignore the population, they ignore the sample. The only thing they pay attention to is what's in their database. That's the third column. So in their database, they have that. Normally what they do without privacy related issues is if they, want to if they have a query, they run the query. Like they want to know the mean, they just say, give me the mean. The database gives them back the mean, they have the answer. That's all they, that's all they need. Um, and, then they're, and then they're done. Well, what about with privacy? So in, the, in a privacy regime, here's what happens. We think about the database itself as private or confidential. So I think of it as the database got embarrassed and it turned red. So if you look at it, you see it turns red, right? So just think of it as embarrassed. Um, <clears throat> that's just like a pre-programmed joke, okay? In any event, um, so that third column now is the database, but they're not allowed to really look at the database. So what are they allowed to look at? Well, there's a data, something like a data generation process where you add privacy protective procedures. And in this case, the privacy protective procedures are noise and censoring. So noise is we're going to add random noise, mean zero to each of these numbers, but then we're also going to censor some of the values. So if some of the values are too big, we're just going to make them smaller. Both of these things can create bias. And then what we get is this differentially private column. So this is basically the idea. Um, this differentially private column, which is the, the third column with noise and censoring uh, added to it, produces a set of numbers and maybe even a summary number like the 111 on the bottom, which have absolutely no interest to us um, in and of themselves. But what the computer scientists would do is they take this number and they'd make a reference to this number. They'd make an inference to this number, right? And that's a fine thing to do. Um, but we don't care about making an inference to a number that is usually of no direct relevance at all. What we care about is getting from this, this number, or really this whole column of numbers, all the way over to this, to this column. And so I go like that. And, um, and I get this arrow drawing here and notice that the entire title of the paper gets, gets in here. So I thought that was good. Um, in any event, um, that's our goal. Our goal is to take the differentially private data and not get back to the database but to get back to the population. And if you actually pay attention to that, you have to change your statistical procedures. What we want as social scientists is to have ordinary statistical procedures, ones that we're accustomed to, but we don't want bias induced by the noise and censoring. So that's what I'm gonna to try to fix, fix today. Okay, so, so let's start with some estimators. In classical statistics, we would have a data set D and we would have some statistic, which is a function of the data set. So I could just write that as S of D, right? You want the mean, you take, sum them up and divide by N, but there's of course lots and lots of statistics. In differential privacy, instead of a statistic, you can think of a, a mechanism. So the mechanism is gonna be M of S and D. 
And the mechanism is going to be the same thing as a statistic, except that it messes with it, right? So instead of just running the statistic, it will add noise in various ways, or it will censor big values, um, it may do other things, and will give you a sort of noisy result. So that's the difference between the two. We have to analyze things differently. In classical statistics, we would have to evaluate the properties of S of D, like is it unbiased or consistent or um, et cetera. Well, we have to do the same thing for, for differential privacy. The, in the interesting thing is that by adding noise and censoring to this process, that's how we protect privacy. So they're essential to protect privacy but they are also fundamental problems for what we do for statistical inference, for social science inference. <clears throat> okay, so what about the differential privacy standard? So I'm gonna give you a simple, a simple or simplified version of differential privacy, just to give you a feel for what the definition is. Differential privacy is actually just a mathematical definition. It's not, it's not a mechanism. You, use, you, you, you apply the, the definition to, to, to uh, the way it's used, but we first need the definition. So here's a simple version of the definition, the full versions in the paper. So think of a data set D with your information in it, and then another data set D prime without your information in it. What would convince you to give your, your data to the researcher and allow it to be in the data? So here's one thing I think that would convince you. Um, if the probability of the researcher getting some results, let's call the results M, is basically the same whether you give them the data or you don't give them the data, then that's okay. Then there's no reason why you shouldn't give them the data. That's the idea of differential privacy. So the ratio of the two probabilities with your data and without your data, see the D and D prime, everything else is the same here, um, uh, is roughly the same. So if these two ratio, if this ratio is about one, or as is written here, in the interval between uh, between between uh, one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon, then um, and where epsilon is a very small number, then it, then it, it, we would consider that private. Um, epsilon is our is the amount of privacy that leaks, and if epsilon is small enough, then that should protect us all. So here, let me give you an example of how this works. So instead of the mean, that is, instead of taking y and adding up and dividing by n, we're going to do two things. We're going to censor and then we're going to add noise. The first part is censoring, the second part is adding noise. So let's do the censoring first. So instead of taking one over n, the sum of i equal one to n of y, now we're going to take one over n, the sum of i equal one to n of the c, which is censored value of y. Okay, well, how much censoring are we going to do? Why are we doing censoring? Think about it this way. The goal of differential privacy is to protect the largest possible outlier. So if Bill Gates might be one of the people in our data set the, and, and the variable that we care about is income, well, that means the amount of noise we would have to add to protect Bill Gates would be enormous, right? So, so, so what do we do? Well, we could just say, we're only gonna pay attention to income up to $200,000. Everything else gets censored down to $200,000. That's the censoring part, okay? That happens here. But then after you take the the average of the censored numbers, this particular mechanism of, uh, it's a differentially private mean, this particular mechanism will also add noise. Okay, now how much noise? Well, this is normal, mean zero, so that's good. So, it's, it, so it doesn't look like it's gonna bias things. Well, you'll see it will in other ways. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and then it has a variance. How much variance are, do, do we have to add? I have a very simple version here just so we can get intuition. Um, <clears throat> this is all very specifically calculated in order to meet this definition up here. So how much, how much variance? Well, the variance has these, these components. The first component is, is lambda. That's the amount of censoring. Now here's the cool Heisenberg-like principle. So if you censor more to get, to, to, to get rid of uh, to the problem of having Bill Gates in your sample, then lambda is larger, but then you add more noise. If you make lambda smaller to censor more, then that's great. You don't, you, 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 that, that's great because, sorry, um, you uh, add less noise because it's in the numerator here, but you censor more. So you're either gonna get more noise or more censoring. Um, and you can't get around that because that's sort of the point, right? There's two other parts here we should just mention. Uh, if, you're, if, if you're adding your information to a data set and the data set is enormous, 
then, uh, you, then we don't have to add much noise to protect you. If the data set's really small, we have to add more. So that's why n is in the denominator. And then also, you have to decide how much privacy leakage is okay. The, the smaller epsilon is, that is the more stringent you are about protecting privacy, the bigger the noise. So the, this whole thing, I think you get a sense that it makes sense. This equation, I'm gonna show you again. Uh, lambda, n, and epsilon are all known ahead of time. Okay. There are plenty of other ways of creating differentially private statistics, um, but, but they have to be analyzed separately. They sometimes add noise to the gradients or the X prime X matrix or the data or the quantities of interest or the likelihood function or all kinds of other things. Oh my gosh, like, it, you, like you don't want these things to happen. It's sort of like somebody sticking their hands in your code and just sort of messing with it before you, before you do your run. You know, it's, it's sort of horrifying. Um, then each one of these has to be analy analyzed separately. The statistical properties of these differentially private mechanisms are usually biased to no uncertainty estimates. All right, so what are the properties? Like, what do you get that's good from this stuff? Well, in addition to privacy, um, one interesting thing about this concept of differential privacy is that if a, particularly, a particular mechanism is differentially private, any function of the mechanism that's not, not, that doesn't reveal the, uh, the private data is also differentially private. So you can post-process the data after we reveal it to you as much as you like. We will use that for bias corrections. Okay, so that's a great thing. Second is the real privacy loss is actually much less than the privacy loss analyzed the way I just described with the bound um, in differential privacy. That's very helpful because in real applications, you can do things in different ways. It gives you a little elbow room. Uh, another fundamental feature of differential privacy is there's a privacy budget, which you can't go past. So let's explain how this works. The privacy risk, the total privacy risk is quantified as epsilon, right? The bigger epsilon is, the more privacy you're giving away. That's, that's more useful than a zero one, um, uh, you know, we, we de-identified or not. Um, <clears throat> a second property is that uh, differential privacy uh, has the property of composition. So if you have one mechanism that is epsilon one differentially private, which means you used a value of epsilon, which I'm gonna call epsilon one, you set it at a particular value, let's say 0 .0, 0.05 or something. And there's a second value, there's a second mechanism, which is epsilon two differentially private. Well, it turns out the total privacy liquid, leakage is merely the sum of the two. So that's great, that's interesting. So if you wanna know how much privacy you've leaked, well, you sum up the epsilons from all the analyses you've run. So that means that a data provider can decide what's the total amount of leakage that I'm willing to allow, and then divide that up among the analyses and among the researchers potentially. Um, the weird thing from our point of view as analysts is when the budget is used up, no new analyses of those data can ever be run again. Oh my gosh, so, so that means we really have to plan. It completely changes statistical best practices. Previously, before differential privacy, um, we would have to balance two things. One is we would not wanna be fooled by the data, and by not being fooled by the data, we would check every diagnostic. We would be careful about omitted variable bias and heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation and, 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 and omitted variable, all kinds of different things. But we also have to balance um, that with being with fooling yourself. And how do you avoid that? Well, you do things like pre-registration. You say what you're going to do ahead of time, you tie your hands, and you don't keep looking and looking and looking. Those things go against each other, right? Well, differential privacy tips the scales in an interesting way. P-hacking or fooling yourself is avoided almost automatically because you can't go and, uh, and, and overfit in certain ways. It's been shown mathematically if the noise is being added to, to the data. Um, on the other hand, you can't explore the data as much. There's not as much serendipity. You can't just find things by, by running lots and lots of analyses. So we have to replace that with careful planning. So this, is very, this sort of changes the way we do statistical analysis. Of course, if you think about it, um, sometimes you, you may have had the chance of, to run an experiment. If you have to run an experiment, you put an enormous amount of effort into the design because it's typically a very expensive thing to run an experiment. I once ran an experiment in Mexico where we literally randomly assigned hospitals to be built in communities where, which had never had healthcare before. And a flip of a coin, 
uh, to, when it landed heads was they were going to get hospitals and tails they were not going to get hospitals for at least three or four years. It was it was not something that I could rerun and rerun and rerun and rerun right like we normally do observational data analysis. So it's not an unusual situation um, to be in, uh, uh, but we but we're in it, so we have to be careful. Um, we can address this with careful software design and, and of course education. All right, so now let me give you an algorithm that solves some of these problems. Um, so it's going to be a differentially private algorithm. There are lots of differentially private algorithms, but most of them, as I said, are biased and don't come with uncertainty estimates. So that doesn't do any, any good for us. Um, there are a few algorithms that, that where we know what the statistical properties are, but they're very specific in that you can only run that one statistical procedure. Well, most of us social scientists, we have a big kit bag of all kinds of procedures and, run, and runs that we want to run. We do not want to be constrained to not be able to use all of or whatever methods we think will be useful. So this method is a general purpose, statistically valid differential private algorithm that comes with appropriate uncertainty estimates. All right. So let me explain, give you a feel for how this works. So to figure this out, we had to figure out how differential privacy works, what, you know, what algorithms there were, then we had to modify it to, to fit our statistical purposes. Okay, so I'll give you an analogy. We'll start with the private data. It's bread, okay? So that's my analogy. Um, next thing is we're gonna partition the data up into categories. So we're gonna take it and break it up into different pieces. We could even put them on separate, separate servers. If you're considering putting your data into the data set, you're protected because your data will only be in one of the partitions. We might have 100 partitions, it will only be in one. And so if somebody breaks into uh, one of the, you know, even 99 of the partitions, they won't necessarily find you. Um, so that's the partition. Next is we're gonna do an analysis in each partition. Um, and then we're, so we're gonna average the results. And it turns out we can make that differentially private. Um, and that, that's really what we want. And, it, and if we're gonna take the mean in each partition and average the means, well, that, that would work, right? But if we're gonna take, let's say, let's suppose we're gonna take the variance in each partition, well, and we average the variances, well, the variance in each partition would be very large, larger than if we analyzed the entire data set and calculated the variance in the entire data set. And so if we calculated the variance in each partition and average, the, average them, we would get a number that would be too big. So, so you can fix that by scaling it up. So we didn't want to have to worry about the scaling. So it turns out there's a thing called the bag of little bootstraps. And so we can add this in and what it does is it takes the data in the partition and it scales it up so that no matter what statistical procedure you apply, you won't have to do any scaling, okay? You can skip that step if you wanna deal with the scaling yourself. Um, then we're going to calculate our estimator. So what's our estimator? It's going to be sandwiches. Okay. So, so, um, and if you, uh, if, if you, uh, know, if you know this, there's a very nice inside joke here. It's a sandwich estimator. And it really pains me that I can't hear you laugh. Okay. So I'll just imagine you're hysterically laughing. Anyway, never mind. Um, so we're going to apply our estimator to the bag of little bootstraps or just to the data in each partition. And we'll just make sure how to, how to scale it up. Okay. Now comes, the differentially private private parts. We're not allowed to see any of these steps. They're all in red on the right, okay? Here's one more step to get to the point where we can see something. So first is we're gonna censor things. So things that are too big, we're gonna make them small. So I cut the sandwiches in half. Then we still can't see that, that's in red. We're gonna run, a, we're gonna run an analysis in each of those partitions. Um, we're going to average the, average the results of the analysis. So now we have the average of censored results. Clearly that's biased, right? You know, if we have the average of censored um, uh, income levels, well, that's not going to be a good estimate of the average of the estimators. It's only, it's a good estimate of the average of the censored estimators, which is not what we care about. Okay. Um, then we add noise and we get something completely different. Not what we're interested in, but it turns blue, so we're allowed to see it. After we censor and we average and we add noise, the differential private pri privacy people say it's okay. We can see that, so that that's where we get to the noise. Um, then there's um, then there's uh, bias correction. Okay, so that's the part that we're going to add. We do the bias correction and we get back to the sandwich. That's our goal. Plus, we're also going to add standard standard errors. Let me just do the same thing again one more time. 
Um, we're, I'm going to put, uh, see that D up there on the top? So, so I'm going to put some notation. Then in each one of the partitions, we're going to calculate a, a piece of the data set. Um, so we have a D1, D2, et cetera. That's the actual formula for the bag of little bootstraps. As I said, if you want, you can, you can skip that. The, the reason why it works is there's a big N for the entire data set, little N for your partition, so it scales it up. Um, okay, so now we have the estimators. So the estimators are theta one, theta two, theta three, whatever, whatever statistical procedure you want to run. If you want to run a prediction from a logit, that's fine. If you want to run two stage least squares, whatever you want to run, there's going to be some quantity of interest, your causal effect, your prediction, your classification. That's what theta is. Okay, now we're going to take those results. We're going to censor them. Okay, and we're going to average them and we're going to add noise. So here's this equation again. First, we're going to censor them. That's that, that's the C. Then we're going to average them. That's this whole thing. Whoops, that's the, uh, that's this part here. And then we're going to add noise and that's this part. Okay, so that makes it differentially private. So now I'm going to describe this thing as theta hat DP because it's differentially private. So this we're allowed to see. We're allowed to see this, but we don't want to see that because it's biased, right? It's biased and it's got a lot of noise. So like, well, what do we, what do we want? What we really want is the average of, of these estimators, but we're not allowed to see that. So how do we get from this to a good estimate of the average of these guys? And that's what we're going to do. So, so let me get there. So we basically have to bias correct this same equation that I keep showing you. Okay. So let's think about it this way. I said, I said just a minute ago that we had five estimators of, uh, 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 from the different partitions here. So now I'm going to go to the next page. And this is the distribution of those estimators. So this is sort of what we care about is theta. This thing is our quantity of interest. That's what we, that's what we care about. It's the, it's the mean of, the, of our quantity of interest estimated in each of the partitions. This mean, it's the mean of this, this, this distribution. Since it's the average as n goes to infinity, it's actually normal. So this is the uncensored distribution. We care about that. Okay, so how are we gonna get that, right? All right, well, what happens? What happens is we don't get to see that. Um, the, the distribution of theta, theta hats gets censored. They get censored at our choice of a value, which is lambda, lambda and minus lambda. Um, so that's the, so the censored distribution is in orange. Um, how much gets censored? Well, I'll just label them, right? There's going to be alpha one in this tail. That's the formula for alpha one, just the integral from negative infinity up to, up to, up to minus lambda. And there's, uh, there's an alpha two, which is, which is this. Okay, fine. I got labels there. What we really want to know is theta. How are we going to get to theta? All right. Well, let's get one step closer. One, one step closer would be the mean of the censored distribution. So the mean of the censored distribution is this theta C. That's the mean of the censored distribution, the mean of all the orange. That's not what we care about because that's biased. But could we get from this to this? Okay, so let's think about this. And first thing, we can estimate this quite well because we get theta hat DP. So no big deal, we have an estimate of it. It's an unbiased estimate of this. It's just not the thing we care about, okay. Um, if you look at this, we now have we now have one equation with one thing estimated. We have a second equation where alpha one is equal to this, where theta is in here and sigma squared is in here. We have a third equation where alpha two is here and theta is in here again and sigma squared is here. So we have three equations, but we have four unknowns. We have, we have theta, sigma squared, alpha one, and alpha two. So we can't do it. You need as many equations as unknowns. So what are we gonna do? Well, what we do, is we disclose, uh, uh, we pay a little bit more of the privacy budget and we disclose one more parameter, which is alpha two. So now we have three equations and three unknowns. So now at this point, we can solve, we can use all the information we have, which are these two known things. And, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, and we have these one, two, three equations, right? We, we, and so basically we have, we now have three equations, three, three um, un, unknowns, and, and we get everything we want. So now let's, let's um, solve for theta and also sigma squared and alpha one. So those are the only, those are the only things left that we don't know, right? So we, so we have theta, that's the, that's the quantity of interest. We're going to solve for that. That'll be our bias correction, corrected estimate. Uh, we'll also get the, dis the variance of this distribution sigma squared. And we have alpha two because we just disclosed it um, and we paid for it with some privacy budget, but we'll also get alpha one if we want. 
Okay, so this is how we do bias correction. Let's go one more step. So now we need standard errors, or so we need a variance, variance uh, estimation. You might think that is, in fact, we thought that what we could do is just disclose the variance uh, uh, estimate. The problem is that the differentially private variance of the thing we don't know is not very helpful. What we really need is the variance of the differentially private estimate. So there isn't any way to use that nice little bootstrapping in the middle to get a good answer. So how are we gonna get an answer? Okay, so this is how we did it. I don't know if you know Clarify. Um, and it, Clarify's 20th birthday is this year. Um, I'm happy to report. Uh, I think we should have a party for it. In any event, um, Clarify works by simulation. There's two parameters that we, that we had to disclose. Um, so we figured out what the distribution of those were. We have the point estimates of those. Those are the mean, uh, uh, the means of each of these things. And we have the variance matrix where we figured out that we could estimate each of the parameters of this variance matrix as functions of these disclosed parameters. Um, and so then we could simulate from this normal distribution. We take the simulations here. We stick them into the bias correction, which is basically the pre this, this bias correction is just the previous slide that showed you how to bias correct these two things. And now comes the three, remember we had three equations, three unknowns. So we get, here's our three unknowns. The main unknown that we care about is this differentially private estimate. I put a little tilde on it just to say that it was different than the hats because this one's gonna be, um, it's differentially private and it's unbiased. And the I is just the I simulation. Um, so now we get a lot of those and we take the standard deviation of all of those simulated values and that gives us our standard error. So that's how we get uncertainty estimates. A cool thing from all this is that we do this bias correction and of course we reduce bias. There's, no, there's, no, there's essentially no bias left. That's what this shows, it's, it's unbiased. But normally when you do a bias correction in various situations, you wind up with more variance. But in this case, we actually wind up with less variance. So we have, we have less bias and less variance. So it uh, tastes great and less filling. Okay, in practice. Um, uh, so we ran some simulations. Um, uh, we, uh, the way I'm gonna set this up is I'm gonna add more and more censoring. And that means the area under the curve to the right of lambda is gonna get bigger and bigger as we go to the right here. And the differentially private but uncorrected estimate is gonna start off with no uh, with very little bias. And then as there's more and more censoring, there's gonna be more and more bias. So no surprise, there's, you know, you censor more, you're gonna mess with the data, you're gonna produce more and more biased results. Um, that, this is the normal differentially private estimate that would come out, but with our bias correction, there's essentially no bias. You see there's a zero here for the vertical axis, which is bias. And so our estimate, which is the blue uh, theta tilde, um, there's no bias, regardless of how much censoring there is. And remember I told you there was a trade-off between uh, having more, more censoring, and, and the, uh, which biases things because of the censoring, and, uh, and less censoring, but if you, have less, if you have less censoring, then you have more noise, right? So there's this trade-off. In this case, for us, because we know how to correct the censoring, it resolves some of that Heisenberg-like um, property. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, this is the, main, the main result. We can show you that we get the, that when there's a large N, there's big bias for the uncorrected estimate and there's no bias for ours, regardless of what the N size is. Uh, it, it, similarly, for the privacy budget that you choose to expend, doesn't matter. We basically have zero bias for, for the whole thing. Um, here's the standard errors. So the um, bigger, so let's see, there's, uh, this is the privacy, this is, this is a differentially private but uncorrected standard error, which is larger than the uh, standard error for our estimate, because as I said, our estimate will also reduce the size of the standard error. And then the truth, the thing that we're trying to estimate when we calculate a standard error is about the same as our estimate. So that's why the blue and the gray are pretty much on top of one another, but they're also below the uncorrected estimate. Okay, and then I show you all four at the same time, mainly because these were so cool results that I just wanted a, a way to dwell on them. Okay, so isn't that great? Um, okay, last, last slide. Um, we're gonna switch from a data sharing regime to a data access regime. Differential privacy protects individual privacy in a mathematical way. 
It enables uh, inference to a, to a private database, not to a population. It's usually biased, usually has no uncertainty estimates, fails to protect society from fallacious scientific conclusions. It is not enough to protect privacy of individuals. You also have to protect society from things that the academics may produce, which would lead them to the wrong conclusions. Um, so we need to add inferential validity. You add inferential validity and, you, and you're okay. A scientific statement is not one that is necessarily correct. A scientific statement is one that has known statistical properties and valid uncertainty estimates. That's what a scientific statement is and that's what we attempt to provide here. Our proposed algorithm is generic. So almost any statistical method or quantity of interest can be used. Because it's generic, it actually costs us um, uh, some privacy budget so that basically you have larger, larger standard errors than if you use some specially tuned um, differential privacy method for the particular algorithm you have, but then you would have to learn a different method for every one that you used and uh, those people programming this kind of data, uh, data access system would just have a lot more work to do. Um, statistically, it's unbiased, lower variance. Uh, it, is, it, it has valid uncertainty estimates, it's computationally efficient, it solves political problems technologically, which was my main overall point, and we have some in, in, implementations in progress. Uh, Facebook is implementing this. Um, I have a totally separate project with the Microsoft Corporation and IQSS, which is the Institute for Quantitative Social Science that I direct at Harvard. Um, is, is, uh, we have a collaboration with Microsoft where we're building open source um, differential private software that will also implement this. And finally, there's a, we have a grant also at Harvard um, uh, to create OpenDP, which is an academic um, open um, uh, differentially private software. So these are my co-authors. I am, uh, would be thrilled to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, I see... Uh, Two questions. Um, this, this is Matt again. I see two questions. One is in the Q&A panel. I don't know if you can see it, Gary. And another one came in via chat. I, I just want to remind folks to ask your questions in the Q&A panel so that we can see them pop up. Um, can you see them or do you want me to yep. read them? Oh, yeah, I see. Uh, let's see. So how is your project with Facebook going to evolve f f uh, from now? In other words, are your efforts there done or do you have more to do? One can think that there remains continuous efforts to, to, to maintain the platform. Uh, there are continuous efforts because uh, we would very much like to, uh, to liberate lots and lots of others data, even though the amount of data we released, I think it might be the largest social science data set ever there's still massively more data. Like the amount of information about the social, political, and economic and cultural worlds that are in these platforms is enormous. And so we negotiate legally and organizationally and, and in ways that you try to uh, convince the company. And yeah, it's not gonna be over anytime soon. Um, so uh, let's see here. Um, so next question is, how does the data access regime, uh, differential privacy approach and your planned open uh, data differential privacy platform relate to the data sharing approach implemented in Dataverse and data tags? Oh, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, Dataverse is a, a big open source project that, um, that I created at Harvard. It, um, you may have Dataverse as yourself. Um, the idea of Dataverse, it was to solve a political problem technologically also actually. Uh, people would either uh, uh, originally have data themselves and would only give it to you if pretty much you at least implicitly promise not to, uh, not to criticize them. Or uh, uh, the proper thing to do would be to take it and send it to the ICPSR or some other archive. But the problem is if people wanted data, they would get it from the archive and then they would thank the archive, even though you might've crawled three years through bug infested fields collecting your data. And that doesn't seem, doesn't seem the, the archive deserves tremendous amount of credit, but that doesn't seem reasonable. So what we did with Dataverse is we broke that that tension of keeping it on your website or, or, or your home or sending it to the archive. Um, we're not professional archivists, but instead what we do is we can add to your website. You can look at my website, garyking.org, and there's, there's tabs just like all your websites for your CV and your, your courses and your publications, et cetera. There's one more website, there's one more tab on my website, which is my Dataverse. 
and, and there's a list of my data sets and there's an incredible array of services there. That Dataverse looks like it's there, it's branded as mine, it has my, my URL, but it's not actually there. It's actually professionally preserved in, the, in, in Dataverse, um, it, which, is, which is backed up by an institution. There's now, there's now um, I don't know, 50 or 60 installations of Dataverse all around the world. You don't have to install it. You, you can um, go to one of the existing Dataverses um, and get a, a couple of lines of code, stick it in your website, and you would have the same thing that I have on mine. So I recommend it. But I ignored your question, so let me answer, answer your question. Um, so where, so Dataverses and Datatex is working very closely with uh, with our OpenDP project, no surprise, of course, because they're all here. Um, and uh, we're going to make Dataverse uh, one way of making differentially private data available to people. So we're building the software into Dataverse also. So. Thank you, Gary. There's, there's no more questions in the Q&A, but there's one more that came up in the chat room. I don't know if, can you pull it up? Uh, is the chat the chat room is the same as the Q&A. Oh, there we go. Um, so second question. One question was already copied into the Q&A panel, but it's the second question in the chat room from, from Richard, actually. Can you mention a particular data set that is currently not publicly available because of privacy concerns, but could be used publicly up to the privacy budget via your differential private scheme? I'm particularly interested in examples that would be of interest to applied social scientists. I think that's a that's a great question. I hope that you all think of the answer to that question. I hope that you all think of the kinds of the, the friends that you have working in private industry and imagine what kind of information that they have access to for their purposes that we might be able to marshal for the public good for for academic purposes. I think it's it's not just like one or two data sets. I think most companies out there have massive amounts of data that they do not think of as research data. I mean, sometimes my sometimes naive graduate students will call up a company and say, hey, do you have any research data? And the answer is no, no, we don't have any data. But of course they do. Because if they have an HR system or a finance system or a personnel, a personnel system or an air conditioning system, Every time you buy a new system like that, it comes with a little spigot, and that spigot spews out data. So, uh, so even though it wasn't designed, it, it was even though it was purchased to help the company with its main purposes, um, there's there's tons of other information. Think of think of big companies out there and the amount of information they have just on their thousands and thousands, or hundreds of thousands, or in some cases millions of employees. Think of, think of how much uh, data we would have about salaries and motivations and all the kinds of things that, that social scientists study. So it's not just some things, it's, it's like everything. It's our job as social scientists to figure out what would be incentive compatible. Because these folks, they're not in the business of publishing AJPS articles. They're in the business of making money, right? If they don't make money, they get fired by their, by their corporation, right? By, by their uh, board of directors, right? So we have to find ways of helping them do what they do, or at least not getting in their way, making it incentive compatible so that we can also do what we do. Even though all of these companies are designed legally so that everything they do in the company is to maximize shareholder value. That's what they have to do or they get fired. Um, still, they're filled with people that want to do that want to do some good. In fact, the people are like our friends and, and former students, right? They were actually really the real human beings and they would like to find some way forward. We can help them do that. So uh, Let's see, as a follow up to the last question, to what extent do you see your mission as liberating data from private companies invested in, indifferent to, or critical of data collection practices themselves? That's a really good question. What would you tell researchers who may indeed benefit from access to such data and benefit from differential privacy, but continue to be concerned with corporate policies of collection and surveillance themselves? That is a great question. Um, I think that that question is the beginning of a, of, of, of a paper that should be written. Um, actually, a whole sequence of papers. Um, I mean, society uh, is, is in a, con there's a constant war between the companies that figure out if they can collect more information like this, they can make more money and can continue to increase shareholder value and the rights of people in the public and then other companies that try to get the information for other purposes. You know, for what, where are we in all of this? 
Well, we can have opinions and we, we, we're citizens. So of course we do have opinions about what these what's proper for these companies to do. We don't get to make those decisions though. If whatever the current compromise is between the privacy advocates and the, 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 the business advocates, whatever, the, whatever the, the current compromise is there, I want us to have a seat at the table. I want us to convince the regulators and to convince the companies that it's okay for us to also do some public good, do some good for the world, while at the same time protecting people's privacy. So, so I think I've done a, a good job of not answering your question, Zoe, but, um, but I think that's sort of the goal. <laughs> so. Thank you, Gary. We're right at two o'clock and I, I just saw another question, one last question come in or maybe it's a thank you. It's just a, it's just a thank you. Oh, there from we go. Zoe. Oh, okay. So we're, we're right at two o'clock. Um, I, I have to maybe use a, as a moderator, ask one parting question if, if you're okay with that. For sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if adding noise, if this process of differential privacy of adding noise and censoring um, reshapes in some, in, in some kind of fundamental way, the way we think about reproducibility. In the, we, when we think about open materials or sharing materials, we tend to think in that sh data sharing paradigm that you were talking about. Um, and so moving to the data access paradigm is fundamental, as you said. But then thinking about the way people think about uh, replication or reproducibility, say the simplest form, just duplicating somebody else's work. Uh, we might think about getting the same result or just understanding very clearly how you arrived at your result. Would we ever get the same result or would we just understand how you arrived at your result? Well, interestingly, it's, it's probably even a little worse than that. Um, you know, if you run, differential privacy aside, if you run a statistical estimator that uses simulation to get to your answer and you didn't save the seed, the random seed, which you should, right. but if you didn't, then you run it again and you do everything right, you're not going to get exactly the same answer. Probabilistically, it should be similar. So that's, a, that's in some sense the, the case that you're talking about. In this case, the randomness is added one time. You don't get to average over it. So you can't rerun re, re it, right? So if you, so what would, what would probably happen in a system where there's a, there's a, um, uh, a ser, you know, a trusted server and things like that, the second person that ran it would get the same noise. So it would be like saving the seed and they would get exactly this, they would get exactly the same result. Um, it is difficult. It's a, let me just tell you the story of, of Facebook, right? So, so in Facebook, yeah, there's a, there's a data set, there's noise added, then, there, then we get the, the differentially private data set. Um, uh, but um, suppose somebody deletes their Facebook account, right? So if, so if somebody deletes their Facebook account, Facebook's legally required to delete their data, like everywhere. Right. Um, you know, so like just for this purpose, like don't delete your Facebook account. <laughs> you can delete it if you want. Have other people delete their Facebook account. Um, but, you know, that's actually a really interesting thing. So in some sense, the data sets rust. Right. right. Um, right. So we've made some, you know, like the, obviously um, this is a very important issue to me. You know, I mean, I, you may know this paper I wrote called Replication Replication right. just a few years ago. Um, uh, and so uh, I, I uh, it has helped uh, uh, annoy people into thinking about this issue to some degree. And um, I think we have to keep at it. And so when, when I first started talking to the folks about Facebook, like they just wasn't in there, they just didn't think about it. Their, their systems are, are dynamic, right? So there's no, the, none of the data, data are just sitting still. Like there's their databases where things are being added and, to, and subtracted all the time. And so for right. us to do what we did, we had to move the data off their system onto a different place and then make negotiations with respect to reproducibility and things like right. that. Right. Thank you so much. So I think we should close there. Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, thank, thanks everybody for listening and I really appreciate it. Yeah. And thanks everyone for attending today's session. Again, a very special thank you to Gary. I hope you'll all tune in again next week, same time, same channel for Michelle Knightian's webcast entitled Checking Robustness in Four Steps. Thank you, happy Valentine's Day, and have a good weekend. Take care.